Hey all, welcome. Uh, we are just getting settled here. We're going to get started in, in just a minute. Um, while we're waiting, um, I encourage folks who feel comfortable to turn on their, their webcam and to also locate the chat box in a, quite, in a minute or two. We'll have a couple questions that we're going to ask folks to contribute through the chat box. You're on the webinar. Mm -hmm. right. Do you need me to come and do what do you need me to do? Basically, I didn't get a chance to check in. All right, so here we go. Welcome everyone. I'm so glad that we could be together today. Thanks for joining us, those of you who are who are on the line from around the country. Um, excited to, to be with you all today. My name is Jonathan Welly. I'm uh, one of the co-authors on the report and will be, be playing the role of host for part of today. I wonder if just a few quick housekeeping requests before we get started. If you do have a webcam, I encourage you to to, to share that, uh, to join us here so we can see who's on the line. Also, um, yeah, great, wanted to welcome, wanted to welcome John, and actually John wanted to ask you to, to kick us off. I think that we've got about 20 folks on the line, and Perfect. we're pretty much ready to, to go in and maybe offer in just a little bit of context around why ILSR released this report, what's exciting and new about it, and then uh, you can turn it over to, to Timothy and I. We'll take it from there. Sounds great. Yeah, well, um, first of all, just thanks to everybody for joining us uh, in this coronavirus safe webinar environment. Um, uh, this is, I've just been very excited about releasing this report it, uh, in terms of helping people to understand how to design good community solar programs. This has been a struggle for the past several years uh, as community solar has become more popular as a way to help people have access to the clean energy economy who don't have a sunny rooftop that they own. And the challenge has initially been to figure out a lot of the technical details about how do you even just create the policy framework, create the compensation for people to do community solar. I think what this report does that's so different is to answer the question, what if we want everybody to be able to participate? How can we design a program so that regardless of whether or not you are wealthy, regardless of whether or not you have access to good credit, um, that you'd be able to participate, but also for cities uh, and for utilities to think about if we want to design programs that accomplish broader goals than just delivering clean energy, which community solar is intended to do, whether that's in, in terms of uh, economic development or cultivating uh, the workforce, how do we do that? What are, um, what are the provisions that we need to consider? And so this report starts at that really high level of how do we do this? How do we make sure everybody has access? But it gets way down into the weeds in terms of giving specific guidelines around specific areas of policy, like compensation, how, how you might develop a queue for projects if you have to do that, what criteria you might use in order to select projects or what are important, uh, how you might favor things around location and other issues. So um, anyway, we're very excited to share this report. Uh, very grateful to Timothy and Jonathan for putting together so much of the content and that we can uh, do our part to help share this information around. So. Uh, I think I'll let you guys introduce yourselves. Timothy, are you tag who am I tagging first here to start out the conversation, Jonathan? I can I can take it back. Thanks, John. Sounds Appreciate good. the context. And thanks for being here. Um, yeah, so just a few things before we get started. Um, one, I'm curious, you know, I, I know that folks are are coming, haven't had a chance to see the report, and I wonder what kind of questions folks are bringing to this. And so I'm going to ask that we go to our chat box, which is over on the right-hand side. And we take just a minute to type in a question that you have that you're bringing to this webinar that you hope that we can address or at least touch on um, over the next hour. And so let's take a minute. And we'll just um, sit here for a bit and take a minute to think and type in a question. And then we'll have a, a nice list to work from throughout the rest of the time together.
Okay, so I threw in a question on the chat. Um, I will also note that if you are an attendee, you're probably on mute. Um, you can, however, raise your hand, which is a, a feature to the right-hand side. And so if you, if, you have a, if you have a question throughout, please feel free to do so. Um, or if you have a comment or connection issue, let us know that way, and we'll be able to unmute you and bring you up. Um, I'm looking, waiting for our second question here on the right. And uh, once we get that, we're ready to move on. Just want to make sure folks have a chance to, to do that and to participate in that way. Here, I think, let's see, we've got a question. I see Anand has his hand up. Anand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, hey, Jonathan, good to see you. Hey. I also posed a question asking what you mean by frontline communities uh, so that we can better an answer the question you posed. Yeah. For sure. So I'm going to type that into the chat box so we can save it. Thanks so much for your question, Anand. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, we'll count that as two questions, then we're moving on. So let's just set some context for for what we're looking at today. Um, you know, I'll introduce myself. Oh, great. Okay. Jessica just mentioned that there are some questions. Oh, I see folks are typing in questions over there. I was looking at the wrong, the wrong direction. Thanks so much. So there's a questions box and there's a chat box, and I'm seeing questions from James and Jim and David, um, and Jill. Thanks everyone for this. So we'll be able to look through those questions together. Um, great. So just some context. So uh, my name is Jonathan Welly. Again, I work at Cleveland Owns. We're a nonprofit here in the city of Cleveland that believes we're only going to build uh, an equitable city when we have an equitable distribution of ownership. And so largely we start cooperative businesses. And some of those businesses are uh, around solar and some of those businesses are around food. And then we're working on a shared purchasing cooperative as well. Uh, and so I was drawn to this, you know, let me tell you the quick version of this story, which is how this all got started. And it was a, it was a hot August day at a coffee shop in Cleveland when two folks I was meeting for the first time, Cindy and Deborah, um, asked me to coffee and, and said that they, they wanted to build a community solar garden. Um, they're from the east side neighborhood of Huff, mostly black, middle class neighborhood. And, uh. I was surprised by this because we don't have community solar in Cleveland, and so it's kind of a foreign concept for the city. But I was inspired by the vision that they brought to this. And so we've started working together, and we've been working together for about two years on doing just that, building Cleveland's first community solar garden. Uh, it's been an exciting project full of ups and downs. We're not ready to break ground yet. We do have a developer on hand. We're in conversations with the right folks who set the policy at the municipal level. And one of the questions that followed from th that initial work was um, if we were to design a community solar program, so there's kind of a one-off community solar garden, but let's say we had actually had a program with multiple community solar arrays, what should we shoot for, right? What's kind of the best case scenario version of community solar policy specifically for a municipal electric utility that will allow us to make sure that communities who have been historically marginalized um, which is another way of describing this idea of frontline communities. Communities that have been historically marginalized um, are for actually first in line to receive the benefits of community solar. And those benefits are broad. You know, the benefits include uh, subscriptions, uh, so monthly savings on bills through subscriptions. They also include um, the actual returns to profit of owning the array. They include owning the land and getting paid each year for the royalties of uh, the land on which the solar array is hosted. We want to make sure that unlike our current energy system, that in, in the future state energy system in a community solar program, that the first folks in line for those benefits are, are communities that have been historically marginalized. And in Cleveland specifically, that often means black communities, low-income communities, working class communities, and communities of color more broadly. Um, so that was the task. And again, uh, Cleveland owns myself and has been working with Cindy and Deborah and a crew of Sam and here in Cleveland to make that a reality. Um, and this project grew out of that. Um, I had a conversation with Timothy, described this question for him, and we've set about trying to answer part of that question through this document. Now you'll notice in the document, um, we don't concern ourselves just with municipal electric utility. The policies and program guidance in this document are applicable not only to municipalities with their own 
um, electric company, but also you know to states and other jurisdictions that are setting policy. So it's a slightly broader mandate, but still comes back to that core of municipal electric utilities. Um, I will, before I turn it over to Timothy to build some more context and then jump in to the report, uh, I, I do want to kind of share an, an omission, uh, an error that I think that I've had to grapple with, which is um, while I continue to work with, with Cindy and Deborah and the crew here in, here in Cleveland, um, I made a mistake by doing this policy work kind of outside of the, without them largely. Um, you know, it was Timothy and myself and a group of folks that we'll, we'll shout out throughout the, throughout the session, some of whom are, are joining us today, including Gilbert and Maria and John and, and Jill. Um, but, you know, I made the mistake in retrospect of trying to write a reporter on equitable community solar in a way that was less than fully equitable, because I did not include the folks who have been most, stand to gain the most, have been most negatively impacted um, by our current energy system who are the, the residents with whom I'm working closely to build the community solar garden. So just sharing that as like a moment of, of transparency and the fact that definitely for myself, I can, I can speak, I am, I am still a work in progress in understanding how to truly do community solar in a truly equitable way. Um, and I hope, hopefully, you know, we're able to, to bridge some of those gaps and, and move forward in a way that's, that's helpful for the group here in Cleveland and helpful for the groups, groups in other parts of the country. Um, Timothy, I want to give you a chance to introduce yourself and maybe say a few words around why you decided to, to spend some time on this project and why you think it's important. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, um, and uh, excited to have everyone here. Uh, my name is Timothy Denner thomas um, I am general manager of a clean energy cooperative based in Minneapolis and working in a number of communities in Minnesota. Uh, cooperative is called Cooperative Energy Futures. Um, we have had the experience of being uh, really the primary community-owned and community-guided community solar development group in Minnesota. Uh, and Minnesota has had, uh, at least so far, probably the most rapidly growing quote-unquote community solar program in the country. Um, but that has also meant that we've seen and experienced a lot of the uh, very corporate and institutionally focused development of community solar that has not really achieved, um, I'd say in, in a large part, a lot of these equity goals and, and been an organization that has a member owned cooperative that is uh, uh, guided by, has members in, and is really designed to serve low income communities and communities of color here in Minnesota, um, really had kind of a unique challenge working in what I think for several years was sort of like a wild west of community solar development to come up with a model that uh, creates access for renters, uh, creates access for low income families, um, proactively engages and supports the leadership and, and project development uh, goals of low income communities and communities of color here in Minnesota. Um, and over the years, I uh, have had opportunities to talk with a number of folks all around the country who are looking to do just that. And, um, you know, have had a number of just kind of <laughs> overview conversations about that. But then when Jonathan reached out to me and, and basically posed the question, is there a policy guideline for how local communities, municipalities in particular, uh, can implement community solar programs, I was kind of surprised that I, I couldn't think of one. Um, and actually recently there have already been a, a few other reports that have come out around um, how to advance equity in community solar policy. Um, I, I think some folks on the call have been involved in some of those efforts. Um, and, and so I think this is really an emerging, emerging field of work. Um, but I, I think what we attempted to do and really the goal of this was sort of to provide a model policy um, in the immediate case to support the work of Cleveland owns in kind of pushing the city of Cleveland to launch this this type of program um, but more broadly as an example that other cities and communities could use particularly where the local government is amenable and supportive to supporting this type of community solar um, but you know also theoretically as an as an organizing tool that communities could use to push 
uh, cities and local governments, um, as well as potentially broader communities in places where that um, that isn't the case. Um, so I, I think you know, given the scope of our collaboration, it, it has been a lot of um, let's come up with the best recommendations we could come up with based on the experience that we've had with both um, you know attempting and having some success creating equitable community solar and also seeing a lot of the policies and program rules that have led to not very equitable community solar uh, in place and, and trying to do something different. Um, you know, but I, I do want to highlight that I, I think this is one example and, and part of a growing body of work around this that um, we are contributing to. Cool. Yeah, thanks, Timothy. Appreciate that context. Um, exciting to think that this is part of a, of a growing body of work. Um, so, yeah, let's jump into the report. I want to I wanna help folks um, get oriented and feel like they you know, have a sense of what fits in here. Um, sharing my screen that shows, um, shows the report directly, and that's what we're going to anchor off of. So let me just scroll through to some highlights. One of the highlights, you know, is this question of how do we define um, who are frontline communities and who do we hope to be at the center? of creating accountability structures and benefiting economically from an equitable community solar program. And so I'm just highlighting this section here, communities at the front line of pollution and climate change, and communities historically and presently disenfranchised by racial, economic, and social inequity. A pretty broad definition that um, helps us focus, I think, though, on specifically communities that have experienced things like pollution burdens, um, and stand to experience the most severe impacts of climate change, as well as groups that are historically and presently disenfranchised by racial, economic, and social inequity. So um, one of the things that we, we learn as we put these together, these guidelines together, is that it's going to be essential for each community to have a chance to define that standard on their own, which is to say each group, will, each community will need for itself to understand Know, who exactly meets that definition. Um, and so we, we try to couch something that's broad enough to be applicable to folks and provide some guidance at the same time. Um, you'll notice that this report also includes an economic development analysis. So we're trying to measure the economic impact of, of what a community solar program would have in Cleveland. And we're gonna spend a good chunk of time later in the report talking about that uh, the chance. And I see some questions, for example, from Jill on um, on more about that, so we'll, we'll have a chance to discuss that later on. Um, so I wanted to just start with just the definition that we offer, which again, folks can read for themselves, but is here um, on page four. Sorry for the excess scrolling. Um, you know, first of all, Community Solar is a, um, a jointly owned or third party um, an allocation of electricity of a jointly owned or third party owned system to offset multiple individual businesses or households consumption, which is to say one array virtually net metered to different off takers. And we're trying to draw a distinction between how that community solar works more generally and how our version of equitable community solar works, which is simply these two lines here. You know, equitable community solar intentionally focuses on benefiting marginalized communities and on prioritizing local community governance and ownership. And when you get to that governance part and that ownership part, you know, I think that becomes clear how this um, adds some tension to the traditional model of community solar, which in many states, unfortunately, is, is owned by a large central investor and utility, for example. And so we're really trying to deliberately push back on that and, and expand that definition to include a version of equitable community solar that puts priorities in different areas. I just want to scroll through. We're going to look at a few different um, sections of the report, and you'll notice there's a lot of detail here. So rather than dive into that, we're going to try to stay at a slightly higher level. Let's start with compensation. Um, so I'm down here on page five. Timothy, um, one of the key features and policy recommendations that we've made around compensation is for um, is to make sure that subscribers receive credits on their bill equal to retail rate net metering. And I, I wonder if you can bring us into the thinking behind that a little bit and help us understand why we chose that as one of our top recommendations. 
Yeah, this was actually a, a, a long discussion in our in our drafting team. Um, there are, I'd say, at least two primary ways that you could go about compensation, and various states have, have done this in, in different ways. Um, one is to use a net metering concept or virtual net metering concept, um, which is effectively the customer gets credited, um, you know, either at their own individual retail rate uh, just as if they were net metering on a solar array on their roof, or in some cases on a, uh, the retail rate of a broader class of customers to which that customer belongs, like the rate for residents in general or small businesses in general. Um, that has been used in a number of places, and um, I, I think one of the benefits that it, it has is that it, um, if you size your community solar subscriptions correctly, it can offset your full electric cost and also it provides clarity and at least some degree of assurance that it will continue to do so over the 25 year life of the project um, because increases in your utility rate that will increase your utility bill will then also be offset by increases in the uh, retail rate based compensation you get for community solar um, this i think is also an important uh, like parity or equity provision in terms of how we think about the opportunities for homeowners or businesses that can put solar on their roof in many areas can get a retail rate compensation um, and and just that those sorts of benefits should be available to renters and other low-income customers as well uh, who can't participate in solar on their own roof. Mm -hmm. The other the other approach uh, for how you could do this which uh, we have some experience of in Minnesota and is also being used in New York and some other places um, is calculating in various places it's called the value of solar or the value of distributed energy resources. There's other calculations. But basically this is a, a very technical and usually very complicated process by which usually a state um, determines here is the value that solar is actually providing to the grid through a lot of different components. You know, what's the value of the, the fossil fuel you don't have to burn? What's the value of the power plants you don't have to build? The transmission lines you don't have to build? The maintenance on that grid you don't have to do? In some cases, what's the avoided value of the, the environmental pollution um, you know, the, that you're avoiding? Um, and so a number of states, including Minnesota and New York, have come up with these extremely long and complicated methodologies for saying, here's the price we're going to pay for a unit of solar energy, and that's the credit that subscribers get. And I think in principle, that makes a lot of sense and, and could be a really strong basis for that compensation rate that customers get. Um, but I think what we have seen in in the two main states where that's being used for community solar is that it ends up being really confusing and not very transparent. And also it changes regularly and without notice and kind of creates this continuous fight with the utilities and the regulators every year to come up with a good rate. Um, that ends up being very uh, untransparent for communities and very hard for communities to establish uh, accountability uh, to in the in the calculation process, uh, and it also has the downside in that um, you know in some cases it could mean that a a resident is paying uh, twelve or thirteen cents or even in some areas much more for their electricity, and is getting credited for the power they produce at a much lower rate, meaning they can participate in a community solar project, and not get a similar benefit to what they're paying. Um, there are definitely ways to make that work, and I think we listed the, the value of solar value of distributed energy resources as an alternative um, that that could be used if it's done right. Um, but in general, uh, I think we just we just felt it was simpler um, and more likely to result in an equitable outcome um, to to stick with that retail rate approach. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, Timothy. And just to recap, if I understand what you said correctly. You know, there are several advantages of using retail rate. One is it's super clear and transparent. Um, two is it's often more predictable as opposed to value of solar, which is often kind of opaque. Um, and finally, there's this kind of a fairness issue, which is that um, even if you have uh, a subscription to community solar, you should see benefits commensurate with those people who actually have the panels physically installed on their roof. Yep, totally. Cool. Yeah. Okay,
so that comes through to me. Um, there's often pushback though, right, from utilities. What kind of, what are some of the reasons why you might expect that um, utilities might prefer a metric other than the full retail rate in crediting subscribers to community solar gardens? Like what's a little bit controversial about that idea? Yeah, um, this gets into a complicated ground. Utilities will often argue that um, with net metering, uh, a customer is effectively getting the benefit of the grid, um, meaning you know solar doesn't produce 24/7, and so even if the customer is producing as much energy as they're using, they're still getting the benefit of power plants that are producing energy, you know, during the nighttime or when it's cloudy or whatever. Uh, as well as, um, you know, the ability to accept the extra power that they produce. And the argument by utilities usually goes, well, you get the benefit of the grid, but you're not paying for it. And therefore, the real compensation to solar customers should be something less. And I think that that gets, uh, that argument is at least politically stronger when you're talking about a community solar project that is often larger and not located on an individual customer's house. Um, than, than it is for individual residential systems. I think the, the flip side of that or the thing that's usually not talked about is, well, that's true, but also cell solar power providers are providing really valuable grid benefits that are not being recognized or compensated simply under net metering. If solar is producing during you know hot summer afternoons, as it usually does, um, that's often a peak power time for many utilities, and that's a very valuable time for energy to be being produced where the real cost of the utility may easily be above the retail rate, and at a retail rate, the, the utility isn't paying the customer for that. Uh, and there's a variety of other things in terms of reducing uh, loss of energy over long distance transmission and um, you know, the, the resilience value of solar being distributed and located throughout a community. Um, that are, you know, are, are not necessarily being discussed on the flip side of that utility argument. The interesting sure. thing is that in theory, you would think that utilities would be more in favor of the value of solar type approach. Um, but I haven't seen that in Minnesota. Uh, you know, they're not very happy with value of solar either. And I don't know as much about the New York context, but from hearing from some folks working in New York, I haven't gotten the sense that they're like, huge champions of that model there either. They're just going along with it. Gotcha. Cool. Thanks for that, Timothy. And, and the, the chat box is open if anyone um, has a question that, that comes up live. That's a little bit easier for me to follow. So if you just want to throw something in the chat box for uh, as we discuss these topics, feel free to do so. Um, Timothy, I want to move us down to accountability. And so I'm going to scroll us down here to to other, um, which includes, you know, how are we going to make sure that programs are transparent and that programs are accountable? And I wonder if you could tell us any stories from your time in Minnesota that uh, led you to believe that including these was really important, these, these mechanisms for community transparency and community accountability. Yeah. So, um, what, what we have found as a, as a co-op, you know, a lot of our projects, we will build relationships, you know, through people in the community who are already excited about projects and, and work with them to identify, okay, where do you want this? Where do you want this community solar in your community? Who should benefit? Like, you know, who are the people in the community who really need to be a part of this? And we found, especially as here in Minnesota, there are so many large developers that that's a pretty unique approach that in many cases, projects are being developed, um, you know, some are pretty far away from the community and there really isn't a community consultation process either about how the project is built, where it's built, you know, if it's like on a green field, what sort of like landscaping or environmental protection is involved, who is employed uh, in the development of these projects, and then also who's subscribing. Um, you know, the vast majority of projects we've seen use a credit score determinant to determine who, who participates in community solar which is deeply inequitable for low-income people and statistically most people of color. Um, and so um, we've really, as a co-op, which is accountable to our membership, we've really seen a huge value in terms of people having a say, you know, all of those things, where should community solar be developed, who should be employed, who should get the benefits of subscribing, 
um, you know, what other uh, economic, environmental, and social qualities do we need to bring to the project development? Um, and we've also talked with many other groups around the country uh, who are trying to do projects like this but aren't in the development role. Like they are a community group that wants a community solar project, but they are essentially going out to a private developer to ask for, hey, develop a project for us. Um, and when somebody else is the developer and they have all of the control in terms of siting and contracts and all of that, I've tended to see the community end up being uh, the entity that is accepting qualifications as opposed to setting qualifications. Uh, it's like, oh, we can't actually make it work for low income people because the only financing we can get requires a credit score. Um, you know, oh, we can't hire folks because there's no qualified businesses out there, you know, which may or may not be true and, and not much support for that. Um, and so having more um, like community advisory bodies that really get to set the rules of the program or the guidelines of what will be offered um, and other mechanisms to ensure that um, communities and, and energy users, particularly frontline communities, are really in the driver's seat in terms of setting how the program should run and determining what projects are developed and how they're developed in a way that benefits their community. Um, it, it just seems really important to change who is making the decisions so better decisions are made. I appreciate that. Yeah, thanks. It's, it, you know, if I could summarize, it's, it's, it's about power, right? Who gets to make those decisions? And uh, the goal in, in the best case scenario, since we had a blank piece of paper and we could draw up how we want this to look in the, in the ideal scenario, one of the things we landed on, on is clear governance mechanisms for local residents in partnership with local electeds and folks involved in the administration of the program to have a chance to sit down in a structured way to make decisions together. Um, and that's pretty revolutionary. I'll direct us here. I'm going to scroll down to um, towards the end of the report. Give me just a second. And, and we described that. So I just want to show folks where we um, where we actually bring this up so that it's clear for everyone. We, we describe our vision for what we're calling a um, community solar advisory committee on page 36. So this is listed here. I'm not going to read it, but it's there for, for more information. Um, and it describes the oversight and accountability that that institution would provide. Um, and this is this is the, the dream version. If we had our gold standard for a community solar program, it would include something like this. Um, and I'm going to ask. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to note, I'd seen a question about where is this working? Um, I'm not aware of something that's exactly of this type and format um, currently in operation anywhere. Um, I do know that in some areas there are, uh, you know, a cooperative or other community-based bodies that are setting the priorities around specific project development, which is, I think, kind of where this concept came from. I'm not aware of, of groups that have this sort of advisory body specifically for community solar. Um, more at a program level, or you know, here's the rules for a whole municipality or region. Um, but I do know that some municipalities and regions have these sorts of advisory bodies for uh, climate and clean energy efforts in general. Um, so this could be folded into that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. I'll just note quickly that right below that, there's a, a summary here on this page that describes um, the role that adders play. So I'm, I'm bringing us back to compensation for just a minute before we move on to a new topic. Um, adders are financial incentives that go towards projects that meet specific criteria. And we've outlined what are the, the criteria that we believe kind of rise to the top. Each community will need to do that for themselves. And so there's a little bit of an adder summary here. I'm gonna scroll up and show you there's also a case study uh, Massachusetts' SMART program it includes a set of adders and incentives that um, ha has been pretty revolutionary and has done a, a decent job of sending a clear market signal that the state prefers these types of projects rather than these types of projects. doesn't solve everything, but it's a helpful way to, to, to get started. And so, you know, for folks who want to learn more about adders, that's a good place to turn.
Um, Timothy, I think that in our last like couple minutes here, before we start talking about the economic impact assessment that Gilbert is going to walk us through, um, I'd like to turn to customer or consumer participation, which is up on page six. So I'm going to make another scroll here to page six. We've included a whole host of kind of consumer rights in this in this list. Um, these are things like accommodating changes of address, simplifying the sign-up process, um, allowing sign-up through multiple methods, um, include like a simple billing and repayment structure. And rather than diving into the like the nuances of each of those, because it's a pretty long list, I wonder, Timothy, if you can help us understand why it seems so important that we include a strong list of consumer protections in a version of community solar that is equitable. Sure. Um, I think this is kind of an area that often gets overlooked in terms of policy design. Uh, it's very easy to do this in a way that it is, that is inaccessible uh, just by process. Um, this is already an unfamiliar uh, option for many households. Um, the idea that you're getting compensated for for producing energy at some remote location at the same time as you are paying for energy you use, and how that's all going to get how that all that's all going to work, um, it is is pretty confusing. We've heard, I mean, we've had dozens of examples of people in Minnesota um, who were pitched, you know, sometimes at their door or on the phone by people who didn't really explain the program. They got signed up. They didn't understand what they were signing up for. They may or may not be getting their bill credits correctly. They may or may not be getting their their charges from their community solar developer correctly. They're confused. They don't know what's going on, and nobody at the developer that they signed up with will answer the phone. Um, and so, as a co-op, we've been getting those questions from random people, and we've actually had a number of people switch over to us because we were able to provide that support. But we don't really want to be fixing that sort of problem after the fact. We want to be creating a program structure that has the clarity and simplicity and, and protects individual subscribers, individual community members from um, predatory behavior, which happens a lot in retail energy markets, um, as well as just uh, poor customer service and um, communication that is uh, confusing or not helpful um, to the individual subscribers. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, there's like a whole user experience part of this, which is like, not only do we need the programs in place, not only do the, the benefits need to show up on your bill through credits, but it shouldn't be an unpleasant, like it, if it is an unpleasant experience, it's going to leave people out. And that's a, a situation that we want to avoid. And so I appreciate, um, yeah, you running us through that. So it's a great opportunity for us to, to transition from looking at the individual policy and program guidelines that we've set out to talk about the economic impacts. And so I'd love to invite Gilbert to, Gilbert, if you're by a, a webcam to share your screen so that we can uh, put you front and center and folks can see, see you as you talk through um, the economic impact analysis. I'm gonna pull up the page while you're getting your webcam set um, where we talk about some of these impacts. And I'll start with Gilbert, the section that's up in the top of the report, so I'm on page I'm on page nine here. Um, I think the question you know, that comes to mind most clearly for me, Gilbert, is helping us understand uh, making sense of these numbers. So what's a little bit around the goal of running an impact assessment? And then you know, maybe the process for how you, how you got some of these numbers. And then finally, like helping us contextualize what these numbers represent, like these numbers mean, mean this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan, and, and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Uh, my name is Gilbert Michaud. I'm an assistant professor of practice uh, at the Voinovich School of Leadership and Public Affairs at Ohio University. Uh, so, you know, I'm a, I'm a professor and I teach courses and do that kind of thing, but we do a lot of applied, engaged research around the state of Ohio, and it's really cool to be connected with, uh, with this team, uh, especially Jonathan at Cleveland Owens and doing a lot of uh, really cool stuff up in that community. So, um, you know, my background is in energy policy. I've done a lot of things understanding uh, community solar program design, 
Uh, I wrote my uh, doctoral dissertation on community solar policy adoption. And so I sort of had my toes dipped in, in various aspects of this report, as we've been talking about thus far, which is, which is really interesting and great. Uh, but sort of most pointedly, if you will, uh, I, I sort of took the lead on, on doing this economic impact assessment. Quite obviously, when we're looking at other aspects of, of this report, you know, these things can, can be sort of broadened out to uh, other states and communities. We're thinking about ways that we can increase equitable access uh, to community solar. But uh, moving forward from that, we also wanted to provide some sort of uh, tangible data, if you will, around what the economic impacts might be from a, from a large community solar array developed in a city. And so we use Cleveland as sort of that benchmarking for that process, right, given our, the relationship with Jonathan and Cleveland Owens. And so, uh, yeah, if you're looking at the report here in, in section four, page nine, uh, you can see a little bit of, uh, of some of these results here, right? And I do want to caveat some of the methodological assumptions that I used for this which are all down, by the way, in the appendix. Jonathan, maybe you can scroll down there later. For now, we can stay on this page. Um, but so basically, you know, I've done a lot of these models for uh, large investor-owned utilities and developers. And uh, what we're using here is NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and their JEDI models, which is Jobs and Economic Development Impact Models. Uh, they have different models uh, for different uh, generation assets, wind, solar, geothermal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the solar models, just as a caveat to those uh, tuning in here, uh, are pretty dated. They're actually pulled out of the NREL website at this point. Uh, but what I've done is basically we've, uh, me and a, a team of PhDs, have sort of modified these, uh, these JEDI models ourselves uh, with another supplementary software that we have access to at the university called Implan. Implan is uh, a, a, a pay-for-play uh, economic modeling software that we have and we can sort of uh, pull out different things like local wages and multipliers and these types of aspects so that we could tailor the solar specific model to sort of the state or regional or, or county level uh, data that we might be modeling, right? So this is sort of a blended JEDI implant approach that you're seeing here. Uh, we use a lot of uh, inputs from uh, NREL's cost benchmarking reports, which sort of have inputs on module costs and uh, labor and different things around mounting and electrical and these types of things, right? So we can sort of go through here and see what we've modeled. We looked at a 10 megawatt scenario, as you see in the table, and a 50 megawatt scenario. Uh, this is a, a fixed mount array. We could ramp this up. We could change a number of different things. We could look at tracking systems. Uh, we assumed that uh, these projects would be completed in 2021. We could change that as well and change the dollar values of, of some of these things. What's important to sort of understand here is as you work your eyes down the table, you can see the construction uh, and O&M cost. And I wanna make this uh, important sort of distinction between this, right? So when we're building out a big solar farm, uh, especially utility scale solar farm, right? We sort of have a 12 to 16 to 18 month perhaps construction phase where we have this really large ramp up of uh, a lot of folks working on uh, these projects, right? Uh, we have PV installers, we have uh, construction folks, transportation, uh, manufacturing of the modules, a lot of uh, jobs supported in that initial phase to build the project. And then once the project's built, quite obviously, and this is not a knock on solar PV as a technology, but uh, it largely is sitting there and, and generating electricity from the sun, which is really cool. And so in the operations phase, which is sort of the life of that system, 25 or 30 years, for instance, uh, we definitely have uh, sort of less economic impacts in terms of job creation, right? And you can sort of see that distinction as we look through this table. So we basically modeled how much is it gonna to cost to build this thing, right? Uh, at the 10 and 50 megawatt scenarios. And you can see, uh, you know, we're looking, uh, if we think of just construction about $12 million, 10 megawatts, almost $54 million at the, 54 mega, at the 50 megawatt level. Uh, and then we can sort of juxtapose that with, okay, what are the contributions that these projects would bring to the state, right? Uh, which is thinking about tax implications and uh, supporting jobs and wages and sort of that amalgamation of all of the different impacts that these would bring to the regional economy. And so it's a little bit of a slippery slope to directly compare those numbers, I would say. But it's an interesting sort of benchmarking process to say, okay, you know, in the 50 megawatt scenario, as an example, it's gonna cost us about $50 million to build out this project. 
but it's going to create almost $100 million of economic impacts to Cleveland and that regional economy. Uh, and, and that's a really interesting sort of selling point, right? Especially we're talking about policymakers, key decision makers, even sort of laypersons around these issues. We try to understand uh, some of these impacts, uh, and I'll talk about jobs in a second. Um, these are really important things that uh, can be used uh, to get projects approved and to have a better sort of tangible narrative around what this looks like. Let's talk about jobs for a second. Um, so you can see here, and this is a, you can see in greater detail in the appendix, I might ask you to scroll down there, Jonathan, I think it's page 35 or 36 if you can, um, where we're looking at jobs, again, in these two phases, right? So we're talking about construction phase jobs and O&M phase jobs. Again, that same distinction of building out a project versus the project is now uh, constructed and interconnected to the grid, and we probably have a few folks who are monitoring, we have some engineers, we might have some folks cleaning the panels, et cetera. Yeah, if you could scroll down just to, to the next page here, Jonathan, uh, real quick. Um, and one thing I want to sort of educate listeners to is that uh, beyond sort of the construction versus O&M uh, impacts, it's also really important to understand the different job categories, right? So at its surface, we're looking at direct, uh, indirect, and induced type jobs. And so by direct, we sort of mean, okay, we have folks who are working as PV installers or in sort of your front lines of constructing uh, this large solar farm that are directly employed uh, by a developer or otherwise working on these projects basically, right? And so you can see sort of these, these breakdown in the construction and installation impacts and the jobs and the wages associated with that specifically. Then when you think about indirect impacts, as you see in the report, we're talking about sort of your strategic partners, uh, sort of supply chain vendors. You know, these, these developers uh, have partnerships with manufacturers who are supplying the panels. We have racking systems and electrical components. Uh, these folks also have you know, attorneys and accountants and a lot of other sort of partners that they work with that might not be directly working on the project per se, so just constructing it, but they're a key part of that supply chain and they're a really important sort of economic driver. They're also feeling the positive economic impacts of working on these projects, right? And that's an important thing that we need to capture. And then if you go all the way down to induced impacts, you can see 31 jobs in that category. And this is basically referring, which is a little further off of this uh, process of, these folks that are directly employed in constructing a solar farm or that are part of that supply chain, spending in essence their disposable income in the, uh, in the regions where they live as part of their normal sort of economic activity, right? And this is something that I do as well. I'm a professor, I have a salary, I go out to eat at restaurants, I spend money at grocery stores, go to the movies, do things that are sort of uh, in my city or in my town or community that are driving and supporting other jobs in ancillary type industries, right? Uh, and these are important to capture as well. And so um, I basically, you can see the numbers here, right? We add this all up at the 10 megawatt scenario as we're sort of showing on the screen. We have 121 jobs, but I really want folks to understand that of the 121 jobs, 31 are sort of in that induced category, which I just explained. And then 37 are part of that uh, supply chain category, which I explained before that. And so directly we're supporting X amount of jobs. And then we're also supporting, you know, uh, 60, 70 jobs through sort of those indirect and induced impacts. And I want folks to be mindful and cognizant of that and be good consumers of that data and say, okay, yeah, we're supporting 121 jobs, but there's different aspects to this. And one last thing before I turn it back to you, Jonathan, is when we think about these categories, it's important to look at this multiplier, right? So you can see the multiplier just in terms of jobs, 3.27. We basically have to subtract one to accommodate for the direct job that's supported. And what this means in sort of a, a layperson way is that for every job directly uh, created or supported as part of a new solar farm development, we are supporting in our regional economy an additional 2.27 jobs. That's sort of what that number means. And that's a really cool thing. It's a good selling point. And again, back to that narrative of why do we do this, right? What can other communities sort of glean from this? Well, we're trying to estimate these, these broader economic impacts. Uh, and again, you know, taking this as, as, as what it is. It's, it's an estimate of what this might bring. It's, it's not a prescriptive, this is what's going to happen necessarily. Uh, but when we go to policymakers or key decision makers or utilities and say, hey, we're gonna uh, have this exogenous shock to a community. We're gonna su support X amount of jobs directly. And then look at this multiplier. We're supporting as well 2.27 extra jobs in this regional economy. That's a really cool narrative to have. 
Um, and there's a lot of other things here, but I think that's sort of the highlights that I, I wanted to share with you all. That's great. Gibber, thank you so much. Yeah, this is Absolutely. A, that was a great, great explanation. I think I learned a lot there too, and I'm grateful that you uh, went through it in detail. Um, I'm going to do, I'm going to suggest we do something wild here, which is unmute everybody. And it's just going to be a free for all. If you're in a noisy place, I'd encourage you to put yourself on mute because I'm going to unmute you. And we're just going to have time for questions. Um, so let's do that. Unmute all. And let's see. I think in theory, I think in, oh, let's see. I'm not sure if I did that correctly. Um, Jessica, if you're there, that'd be helpful. But yeah, let's open it up for questions. Um, we'd love to hear if some folks have uh, something they'd like to ask. Maybe yeah, now's a good time to do it. Yeah. Let's see, I'm not seeing any, not hearing any questions, which is okay. We've had a chance to ask questions throughout the presentation. Um, let's go, uh, Jill, I wonder if, if you would be comfortable asking the question that you wrote out in the box, but just ask it live, and that way we can have a quick discussion around um, so kind of applying some of the economic lessons that Gilbert talked us through. Do you mind doing that? It doesn't seem like the unmuting. Okay, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, all right. Um, yeah, uh, I've worked on this project with you guys a little bit, and, and I'm excited about how it might actually be implemented. So I know that this economic model um, that we were just looking at was very authentic for the community that it was applied to, but outside of Cleveland, um, are, do you have any tips on you know, how people might interpret this work so that they could make that linkage to their own community? Appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. Probably a question best for Gilbert, Gilbert, which is kind of applying the economic lessons to places other than Cleveland. I think it might be muted. Hmm. Gilbert, it looks like you're muted, which is surprising. And it looks like I do not have an opportunity to unmute you. Um, Jessica, if you're there, could you help us unmute Gilbert? Hmm. Gilbert, are you still muted? Looks like it. Okay. Surprising. Um, this is on the Yeah. Why don't we go uh, to another question, Gilbert? We're trying to figure out why you are muted. And in the meantime, let's put that question on hold. We'll go to Anon. This is probably... So let's let's start with that, Anand. Yeah, so I just want to check sure that you can hear me. Sorry, sorry about the other person's question. Maybe hopefully you can get back to the you know, connect. But I, I just wanted to understand that I know it's hard, but are there any examples of rogue communities who've done any IOU based communities for the project? I guess in Ohio. I mean, I'm just trying to understand that if there's been any or any anybody who's been I know like Cincinnati does a lot and I, I have contacts there, but just wondering if there's been any or any other state too where you know, we don't have to rely on just uh, one entity. Uh, the local utility. Yeah, so the question is, is there an example of community solar in an investor-owned utility territory in Ohio? And or neighboring states. And neighboring it's, it's states. Without, without a backing virtual net metering policy. Without a backing virtual mm -hmm. net metering policy. Yeah. Right, because that gets into the thorny question of who's actually setting the rules for, for these uh, community solar programs. And often that happens at the state level through the PUC. Right. Um, municipal electric utilities give us a chance to break free from that because they're actually almost exclusively regulated by local regulators. So in the case of Cleveland, Cleveland City Council gets to set those rules. Um, 
I know of one, I think Dayton Power and Light, which I believe is a renewable uh, electric cooperative, has a version of a community solar program. And so that's kind of the gray zone. They're, they're not an investor-owned utility territory, but they're close to it. Uh, and they have instituted some sort of community solar program. And then there are examples of investor-owned utilities, you know, authorizing, kind of doing community solar programs. It's not clear to me entirely if they have the full legislation that they need to do that at the state level. So I'm thinking of an example in Michigan, where I believe there is not statewide legislation to do municipal electric utility, but there are some community solar programs. In truth, I don't know exactly how they how they found the policy space to do that. I'm so, guessing Timothy does. Yeah, I can just jump in. Um, you know, as Jonathan was saying, and as I think many folks know, there are many rural electric co-ops and some municipal utilities that are doing these projects on their own. Um, but as far as I'm aware, in the cases where the investor-owned utility has done this without broader state authorization, it is usually projects that are that are called community solar, but that are owned and operated by the investor-owned utility. Um, sometimes with a third party uh, that the investor-owned utility is contracting with. Um, it it's sometimes unclear whether it is the same thing as other things that are called community solar. For example, a utility could run a solar project where you can pay a little bit extra on your utility bill and uh, get the renewable energy credits. And that would, in some cases, be called a, a community solar program. I think, um, as far as I'm aware, some of the projects in Michigan, and I think the new proposal in Florida is that sort of model. Um, but again, in that case, it's not that the customer is necessarily getting compensated for the power that is produced. Um, it's a transaction that allows them to count that energy as, as theirs. Um, the utility, uh, I think in many cases, would have to get permission to run an alternative tariff like that from their state regulators, the PS, the Public Service Commission or Public Utilities Commission, depending on the state. Um, but usually if the utility is doing that voluntarily and it is a voluntary program, there would not be much regulatory uh, opposition. Um, but again, that often doesn't fit the criteria of equitable that we're trying to advance. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Timothy. There's a lot of nuance there. We've got just one minute. Yeah. I want to go back. To, to Jill's question um, and ask Gilbert to take a quick a quick stab at that now that I believe you're you're off mute. Yeah, I think I'm unmuted now. Um, yep. Yeah, I'm happy to address that. And one quick point before I do, uh, just to clarify one thing for you, Jonathan, is that uh, Dayton Power and Light is in fact an investor-owned utility, just as an FYI, uh, not you. a co-op. Um, yeah, you're welcome. So, so yeah, it's a good question, right? This. The, the model and sort of the data that you see here from an economic impact perspective is highly specific to Cleveland and the state of Ohio. And to clarify one other thing, which is in the notes as well, is that um, Cleveland itself as a city doesn't necessarily have all of these different uh, manufacturers and labor and components to support like a 50 megawatt array within the very narrow confines of the city limits. And so what we did to sort of uh, have the most impact, at least illustrate what the highest impact could be, was open this up to the entire state and say, okay, anyone in the state, we can look at these different uh, types of vendors and supply chain uh, and installers coming in from wherever and ramp those uh, local purchase percentages, if you will, up to 100% to see what the maximum impact would be. If we restricted this very, very narrowly to the city limits, uh, these numbers would probably be less. And in theory, that makes sense, right? Because we have sort of economic linkages that might bleed over into other parts of the state, or maybe there's folks coming in from uh, nearby Pittsburgh or, or whatever the case might be. I think, um, I, I would say, however, an argument of the data that it's a good sort of ballpark benchmarking uh, to go through and say, okay, we think the impacts will be sort of, you know, plus or minus, however you want to caveat these things, 100 jobs, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It, when when we're looking at different states or cities, there's different things you do have to accommodate for, right? So in Ohio, for instance, we have a different sort of suite of tax laws that other states uh, might have different, right? And so some states, for instance, for solar projects have like property or sales tax exemptions 
And um, as you're doing these types of things in your own respective areas, be mindful of those as you're building this out and have different inputs. So you basically are going to have local inputs for wages and labor and tax implications and all these things that make your model specific to your city or utility area. Um, and that's sort of what we were looking at here. So I, I would say that the Cleveland data that you see is, is pretty cool and interesting. I wouldn't use it and say this is going to be the same thing in Austin, Texas, per se, uh, but that the ballpark range might be about the same, give or take, uh, but you should tailor it to your sort of situation with regard to state policy and wages. Cool. Gilbert, thank you. Um, I know we didn't have a chance to answer all the questions, but appreciative of everyone joining us. I'm going to leave my email address here in the chat window so anyone can send me a message if they'd like to follow up. Please feel free to do so. My thanks to the whole team who worked on this, you know, Timothy and Gilbert and Maria and Jill and John and um, Gabe and many folks I'm forgetting, uh, who Corey, who helped pull this together. Uh, grateful to share this with everyone today. Let us know if there are any questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you all. Yeah.